This is the final word, T20 World Cup Daily, day 15 and a half, the other half, the second half, the half that was not done earlier today by Cameron Punsonby and Daniel Norcross. It is instead Jeff Lemon and Rory Dollard. We are in Antigua. Uh, we saw England play at Namibia. That's the most important bit that happened. The show is brought to you by Westfield London, Westfield Stratford City. England, Namibia. Rory, tell me about it in 30 seconds. Okay. All been well. 15 seconds of this should be different descriptions for rain. It rained. It rained. It rained. It rained like you've never seen it rain in Antigua before. And it was down and out. Everyone was thinking, game over. Well, they managed to get a 10-over game in. England batted first. They made 122 for five. They had a bit of a sticky start. Josh Butler duck. David Visa did the David Visa good stuff. Looked like they were going to struggle. A couple of Yorkies, Johnny Bairstow, Harry Brook, bailed about a jail. And after that, honestly, it wasn't much of a chase. It didn't look like it was going to happen. But Namibia gave us a bit of fun. They retired out their batsman, Nicholas Davin, and gave David Visa what happened to be a farewell. He's retiring from Namibia. So that was your lot. England go through as long as something doesn't happen tonight. Yes, we're recording this before the Scotland-Australia game because we're doing the late-night games the following day, so we don't know what's happened there um, at the time that we're recording this, and you might not at the time you're hearing this, or you might. Uh, it might be a glorious upset for the Scots, but it was probably more likely that that's not going to happen, just just historically. You know, the, the, the long history of Scotland beating Australian cricket is not there, per se. But today... Uh, Today was one of those days. We were it was supposed to start at one. Um, I think we were at the ground by about eleven, ready for a for a one o'clock start. We got out of there by about eight pm, seven thirty, something like that. It took all day. It took until the final bit. There was this just one weather system that somehow was sitting right over the ground, even though we could see patches of blue sky in every other direction. And England must have been stressing out of their heads. They must have been sitting in that dressing room, worrying about it and worrying about it because had it been rained off, they were gone. Uh, and it, really looks bad particularly the, the heaviness of the the showers and then we were getting all this water coming off the covers and big puddles at the boulders run-ups and and so on but the ground is is based on sand and that's usually a metaphor for something not being good <laughs> something built on sand but in this case it turned out to be great yeah i actually after the press conference is finished and the game was all wrapped up i, I walked across the outfield right through the middle and i i, I touched it because we had so much rain such a volume uh, of water came down on that pitch and I touched it and it did feel pretty dry. Mm. It it was the kind of standing water at sort of the bowlers run-ups that in England or in a lot of countries you write the game off mm. almost as soon as that pool starts. Well, it actually cleared out but yeah, I think England probably, I don't know if it helped them uh, when they got back on the pitch because they would maybe started to mentally think that it was over uh, and then when they got out there was a bit of freedom uh, in there but it was... It was. I think they'd be lying if they said that they weren't a bit worried. We spent so much time talking about mm. Australia engineering England out of the tournament, and then we forgot that England usually get knackered by the rain. <laughs> well, they got away with it this time. They had an 11-over-a-side game that then got reduced to 10 overs a side thanks to another short rain interruption once we'd actually started playing. Managed to get on by 4pm uh, and, and got going there. And for a minute, it looks like... Those England heads in the dressing room might have been too befuddled thinking about what was happening next. Uh, David Visa bowls the first over, concedes one, concedes one in a, in a, in a what's then an 11 over game. Uh, Trumpelman comes on to bowl the second, swings the ball beautifully into the pads of Butler, hits his thigh, goes back onto the off stump, knocks his off stump out of the ground, fourth ball duck, not what you're expecting from Butler in a game that short. And then Phil Salt, who started so brutally against Oman with two sixes from the first two balls of the innings before he got out. The other day, got out here for what was it, eleven off, eleven off eight, something like that. He uh, he he gets Visa bowling him this this canny sort of knuckle ball yeah. that's that's slow and it swings away in the air and it seems off the surface and it takes the outside edge as he tries to run it down, and he goes. And even though Bairstow hits a four in that over, that's two for eighteen after three overs in what's power supposed play. to be an eleven. <laughs> that's the power play in an eleven over game, and they're going at a run a ball. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, it's hard to look at the scorecard yeah. and and be clear on quite how much peril England felt like they were in for that first few moments. Yeah. So Visa, his first 10 balls, mm. he's one for two yeah. off 10 balls. Uh, Butler's gone for a duck. It, it, it did start to feel like England might have been so sort of het up about the situation that they came out and they were a bit, a bit frazzled. And bear in mind also that they'd dropped Will Jacks for this game and they'd basically got a, a specialist batter light. They replaced him with Curran but he bats low down. Mm. So actually, two, two of your openers down, 
one of your top three sitting in the sheds. It was an interesting situation, and I think it's a really decent effort by by Brook and by Bearstow to take that game on and knowing that the stakes were pretty high if they pop one up. I know you listen, I know you can't exactly slam the brakes when yeah. you've got an eleven over game, sure. stroke a ten over game, but they had to do it right. And and you know, they say sometimes in a in a, in a, sh- a short game sort of the, the class players show out because when it's difficult and and the pitch kind of is awkward, getting to the kind of score you need is not as easy as you think it is. And those guys played extremely well, I thought. Yeah, and, and they almost had that opening. Besto has that huge top edge that goes just over the bowler and manages to evade a catch. And then he should have been run out to, it was Erasmus, wasn't it, who yeah, fumbled yeah. fumbled the take at the at the bowler's end. As the ball came back in, and well, would, that would have been Brook run out at the other end. I can't remember who well, was on strike. It was Johnny running back. Yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, and they were quick between the wickets, but you know, th- another wicket could have fallen there. I thought the misstep for Namibia though was was with the opening bowlers. So you have those first three overs, and then he goes, and Erasmus goes, okay, I'm going to turn to Schultz, who's my left arm spinner, and then and then me will do the slower stuff because in this game you could do you, you know you're bowling two overs max. Trumpetman's already got the ball swinging, and so you've got that opportunity, and it's humid and it's sticky out there. You give him another over. I thought at that point, try to take another wicket off the top, get him to pitch it. Up up and swing it and visa and this was maybe the, the biggest missed opportunity of the game 11 over game every, three. someone can bowl three overs if you get david visa to bowl his third over up top maybe he takes another one there they decided to go conservative and try to keep him for the back end and then it rains again it gets reduced to 10 overs which means all your bowlers are two max so visa's already bowled out had they bowled in then they would have been able to burgle that extra that third over from a bowler who then wouldn't have been allowed to bowl it later on um, and they, they they would have had that that bonus in their innings if he'd been able to I mean just just he was red hot the way he was going right at that time he's their clutch guy yeah. like you, which we saw studded all throughout the game really he bowled two overs he would have bowled three they were, they were clearly keeping him for the last over mm. they wanted him to shut the thing down yeah. bowl the last over he then, you know, they, they engineered the situation later on to get him in batting. This Namibia team, bear in mind, he also batted and bowled in the Super Over in yeah. their first game. This Namibia team is David Visa, mm. and David Visa is walking off into the sunset. So a little bit tricky, but, you know, England, with those Yorkies in the middle, they did get back. And actually, they're both players, arguably, with a little bit to do. Johnny Bairstow was under a bit of criticism. He was well aware of that criticism, I, I should point out. Oh, yeah, he was very stroppy in the press conference yeah. after the game. He was ticking, but that's great. That's absolutely fine. That's how you want people to react. No, who, who the hell likes to be told they're useless? Good on him. Uh, you just would think he'd be used to it by now. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's played over 100 tests. He's, yeah. he's been criticised uh, often all the way through. He's had periods where he's deserved criticism. He's had periods where he gets praised through the roof for being great. Surely by some stage, by sort of 35 years old or whatever he is, you've you've done it enough times that you're not still mad about it? Yeah, but I think we're, we're at the point now, aren't we, that nobody wants to get Johnny out of that phase. If, if anything, you want him there all the time, right. but it, it's, it's not possible. But he had never got a good score in a T20 World Cup. That was one of the stats that was being held over him a little bit, that he'd never really got a win. Never His got highest score was 18. Yeah, so he got 31 today. And it was an important one in a, in, a, in a short game. Harry Brook, fantastic talent. I mean, a real class act, a real class act across formats. But maybe was searching for a, a bit of a, a statement innings in a, in a World Cup. He was a bit of a, he had a quiet 22 World Cup. He was sort of the extra yeah. player. And, a, and his 50 over World Cup. 50 over World Cup, he couldn't really get into the team when he did it. Didn't yeah. quite work out. He had that one good innings against Afghanistan, didn't he? Yeah, he did. But you know, he lost the game. So he, he maybe was someone who could have used something to hang his hat on. Yeah. And today they got that. So because of the, the shortened games that England have been involved in in this tournament, yeah. that the not get batting against Scotland, having to do it in a mega hurry uh, against Oman. It's actually quite important that a couple of their middle order guys had a even, albeit a pretty short one, mm. but they had a hit because the worry going into your super eights with a, a batting lineup that hasn't really seen the light of day, it could get tricky. But that's it's a couple of them who are in the in the tournament now. So they go uh, through. They, they face Schultz, Erasmus, uh, Brassel, the right arm seamer, the younger guy who got absolutely pummeled, and, and Erasmus again. And and that's Brook and Bairstow scoring heavily. Brooks using the the scoops and the the ramps and so on. Bairstow's just kind of well, he, he's got that one straight hit down the ground, but he's going for his pulls and sweeps a lot. Um, he ends up getting out. There's cues one up in the air in the in the eighth over, but then Moen comes in similarly aggressive. Um, he carries on. Uh, 
Liam Livingston comes in towards the end and, and whacks a couple of sixes. Sort of at the death, they have that rain delay in there as well. Um, but they were they just never took the foot off. That last over was a case in point. Trumpleman bowls the last over. Yeah. Six, wicket, six, six, two buys, wicket, which was a run out um, going, yeah. going through for an extra one off the last ball. And, and the two buys should have they they were getting one at that point and then Trumpleman misses the throw at the non strikers end from three metres away and, and gives away an extra run. Yeah, a bit of a brilliant explosion than that really. It was he, he didn't need to be throwing it. If he was throwing it he needed to be hitting. Um but England could have underarmed it though. Yeah, I mean yeah he could have, he's bloody huge. He could have dived I think and he could have just stretched out and, and it probably hit the stubs. But England's got I think forty off the last two overs after that rain that mini delay. And actually in the scheme of the game Nailing 40 off two overs probably took their total from strong to out of sight. Yeah, it, it felt almost impossible at that point. Jack Brazzle, none for 32 off two. So he's gone at 16 and over. Erasmus, 26 off two. Schultz, 24 off two. Trumpleman, 31 off two. And then compare that to David Visa, one for six from his two overs. <laughs> Ridiculous yeah, I mean, stuff. What a way to go. I mean, this, uh, age, is, age is just a number. He's, he's got 39, I think he is now, but... <laughs> the contract offers will be flying in because he can get the job done. The chase was very disappointing. Michael Van Lingen and Nicholas Darwin, who are sent in to open, just a lack of versatility from Namibia. They just didn't, they weren't prepared to try to change things up. I thought, okay, 10 over chase, you, you, you need 12 and a half and over at the start of your run chase. Who are your best hitters? Get get Erasmus up there, get Visa up there. Like, sure, the ball might swing a bit early, which it did from Topley, but. Their opening pair couldn't lay bat on ball. Um, Van Lingen, he's the left-hander. He kept he played, I think, about six or seven pull shots that didn't connect at all, and he just kept playing the same stroke again to Topley um, and then to Archer. He manages to get a couple of top edges away for a, a four and a six. But aside from that, I mean, they were scraping along at barely a, a run a ball at that point. And by the time, you know, say three overs had gone by, Topley goes for six off his first, off those two overs that he bowls up the top. The game's done. It, it just, it just felt like a surrender. It was, it was annoying that they, they weren't prepared to try to be a bit creative to go after it, which England were. They changed their 11 once, yeah. once they found out it was going to be a shorter game. They brought Curran in um, and they brought Jordan in, in place of Jacks and in place of Wood. So I, I just, I wanted to see some adaptability from Namibia to say, well, we might not get this, but we're going to give it a proper shake rather than we're going to knock it around at a runner ball. I think I'm, I'm wondering, as I said to you before, while we were looking at the scorecard there, I was like, did Van Lingen, what, what did he score, 29? Yeah, 20, 33 off 29. 33 off 29. So is he going today thinking, I left a few out there, I didn't quite get up with the rate? Or is he thinking, I've just got 33 off 29 against <laughs> Joffre Archer and, yeah. and, and, and Reese Topley, all these guys. I mean, maybe he's just done a good job. Like, maybe that's where they're at. It's, we can't be expecting them necessarily to go nail 10s and 12s and over against this England attack because on that pitch... Yeah. It still, it was tacky, sticky. Yeah. Topley, from his height, I thought, got the read on them. It, it, it was difficult for them to know where they're at, where they were going to access on the pitch to, to, to get runs. Archer, he did actually <laughs> accidentally score ten in two balls yeah. off Archer, where he sort of half evaded, half weaved and bobbed, but he left his bat there. And it sort of periscoped one for six and one for four. So there, there was maybe ways and means to get through it, but clearly. I don't know, after about two overs, presumably the conversation was being had up in the coaching uh, room yeah. about when we're going to send Visa in because they've hatched this plan to, uh, to pull Davin. Yep. And it, it, happened, it was so low-key. He just sort of wandered off, sort of begrudging, sort of that he'd, he, he got 18 off 16. Yep. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we've seen a retired out in a high profile, certainly not a global tournament, a global oh. international tournament. I don't remember it in an international match at all. I remember Ash when doing it in yeah. the IPL, but I don't think we've seen it in international cricket as a, a retired out for his 18. But they did that at the end of the sixth over and by then it's just gone. It was so far out of sight. So th that was the frustrating bit, I thought. I mean, Visa ends up with 27 off 12 balls. Now, who knows what happens if he opens the batting. But if if you have someone who could do something like that up top, then you're they leave you in a position where the win is still on the table. You know, if you've got... you You, you don't need somebody necessarily to make one huge score you need everybody to make small fast scores and you can't afford to have anybody leaving dot balls uh, I mean the, the first ball of the match was a leave because uh, Van Lingen thought that it was a wide it wasn't a wide he just left it alone it was a no ball in the end and then he couldn't score off the free hit so the dot balls were killing them leave it 
It just looked bizarre, didn't yeah. it? You're chasing a pretty, pretty 126 <laughs> of 10. And he rocks it up and he's like, yep, yeah, leave that. Yeah. What? Get in the pace of this pitch, build a foundation, yeah. wickets in hand. <laughs> wickets in hand only goes so far, my boys. <laughs> Not touching that one. Well, they ended with plenty of wickets in hand. They ended with seven wickets in hand, and it didn't help them because they only made 84, uh, and that was with Visa's heroics at the end. Erasmus comes in and faces three balls. I mean, he's the guy who took it up to Australia the other day when they were being pumped, and he started hitting sixes and, six and fours there. I wanted to see those two open, um, you know, rather than looking at, like, a Michael Van Lingen, who, you know, just by the way, his last few scores for, for Namibia across formats, uh, 10, naught, 4, naught, 4, 10, 7, 20, and 10. So... <laughs> He's had a day out. Yeah, and he's, he's well performed. Yeah. He's had a great day. <laughs> he's had a great day that lost him there. Uh, they, I mean, they weren't going to win it, but still. Anyway, I'll stop banging on about that because uh, we have reached the break. This is the final word, the T20 World Cup Daily. It's brought to you by Westfield. We are about to go into the Super 8s, but if you're looking for Super Eats... Uh, See what we did there? Look no further than Westfield London. You can eat your way around the T20 World Cup in less time than it takes to delete the angry tweets about Australia not respecting the spirit of the game that you had preemptively written in your notes app. Enjoy the butter chicken bomb from Bindas Eatery, the incredible jerk flavours of Rhythm Chicken. There are some incredible jerk flavours in some of these teams as well. Uh, Slow-smoked American barbecue at Big Easy and Australia's own donut time. The only food that you won't find is from New Zealand, but that's okay because you won't find them in the Super 8s either. Westfield, London. Westfield, Stratford City. Paint with all the tastes of the wind. Right. Uh, let's see. We, we also should have a look at the Uganda-New Zealand game of last night. Speaking of teams that aren't in the Super 8s, neither of them are. It didn't much matter. Um, it was another stomping. Uganda bowled out for 40. Uh, New Zealand chased it in 5.2 overs because why not? A uh, memorable 22 not out for Devin Conway. He'll have a photo of that up on his wall, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, r- the scrapbook. <laughs> uh, but the, the New Zealand bowlers potentially, I don't, know, I don't know about how often this stuff happens, but none of them conceded double figures. And they bowled 18, 18.4 overs. Mm. And so we got one, two, three bowlers got their four overs in. One got 3.4 and none of them hit double figures. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's good going. There, there, are, there are a handful of T20 internationals involving Mongolia and Mali and so on where they were all out for six and that yeah. kind of thing. But uh, for, for an international of this level, it's quite uh, fetching really. Trent bolt two for seven, Saudi three for four. Santner two for eight, Ferguson one for nine, and Ravindra two for nine. So, now, so I think two of the four cheapest four over spells ever at a T20 right. World Cup. So, out of the top four cheapest four overs that we've ever seen, yeah. two of them were in that match. So, you do have to beat these teams, yeah. but you know, I reckon they've done all right. It, it's, I mean, it brings to an end a, a campaign for Uganda that was a massive triumph that they were even here. They, they were, it was a huge upset for them to beat Zimbabwe in the African qualifying stage and get that spot um, to come here to, to compete. They've been massive crowd favourites. Um, a, a few of our Final Word crew were out there at the game last night wearing the Uganda shirts and, and, and cheering them on. Uh, so they've been, they've been a good news story and they've got a win. You know, they beat PNG. Um, yeah, plenty, but, plenty of teams have waited longer for a, a win at a global tournament than, than that. You know, they, they came, as you say, I think third ever World Cup that, that a Ugandan sports team has qualified for mm. across the but like across right. the whole All gamut. The yeah, they don't they, they don't go to World Cups mm. across uh, sport. Mm. So they're, they're here, brilliant, and they won a game. Okay, they got rolled over thirty nine forty. Fine, they'll be all better for it, and it was honestly good to have them. It was uh, it was a dominant performance. Their scorecard reads two naught 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 eleven two four three nine naught one uh, three golden ducks in the innings. So it was rough at the end, but I, I suppose you can expect that. Yeah, they they were all out for fifty eight against Afghanistan, thirty nine in the last game, and forty here. But they do have that win where they were seventy eight for seven and chased it down. Um, they've had those moments, and New Zealand will be feeling a lot less happy about their World Cup campaign, even though they got that win at the end. Yeah, it, it doesn't change really for New Zealand. It's been a disappointment. It's probably the end of the road for this iteration of the team. If it's not the end of the road for this cycle... It probably should be. Well, it, well, if it's not the end of the road, it's for lack of options, not, not because there's any real good reason. Yeah. This is a team that has been... Fantastic, amazing tournament competitors. That's they've always mm. been a tournament team, and even right through to the Test Championship. As soon as there's a, as soon as there's a route for New Zealand, mm. they have found a route to to get there. This time they haven't, and that probably signals the end of them. Yeah, certainly. I guess that team from about 
2014 or so is when it felt like they they really became a force. It's it's McCullum's captaincy at first and through that 2015 World Cup and and it was all about Bolt and Southie in in 2015 and I suppose the batting has turned over more. Conway's come through, Ravindra's come through, Finn Allen's around, so they're you know they're they're. they're that's at least been freshened up. Daryl Mitchell wasn't a fixture, you know, mm. back back in that sort of era. But the bowling feels largely the same. Mitchell Santner seems to have been there for 15 years. Mm. And, um, yeah, maybe maybe it's time. It is, yeah. And, and, and you think they have talent to build around. Ravindra, of course. Yeah. You know, great great talent. And a couple, of, a couple of younger faces. But you feel like, and I don't want to over it. I said it the other day as well. You feel like this is a tough moment. For, for New Zealand and they it's hard to find players of the caliber that they've had mm. they have had world class players and as they age out there's going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a moment to yeah. pause and take breath there's no like for like for Trent Bolt to, to bring in for instance all right the final word Hall of Fame the things that tickled our fancy I, I particularly enjoyed uh, forgive the self-referential nature here but the, we had we were doing a lot of rain fill on the radio coverage today so we, we got you up with Chris Stocks to talk about the England team and, and at that point it didn't look like we were going to get on and basically we did the long post-mortem of what what would be the response if this game got washed out and they ended up being knocked out would it be would it be the end of the road for England would everyone get sacked all the rest of it and you just said right at the end you said well we should just clarify that um, this may not actually all of this will be redundant if we actually get on and have a game here and they win and of course they did yep yeah, it was uh, it was the premium waffle yeah. uh, none of which uh, need ever see the light of day again don't, please whatever you do don't seek it out don't clip it up <laughs> don't publish it we don't need it none of all of that is redundant none yeah. of it needs to be on the air uh, my favorite my favorite uh, man of the day was the, uh, the the chief groundsman, uh, the fella who was in head to toe. I don't. It was it was a mix between Walter White in his yellow meth cooking kit and <laughs> like a very untrendy angler who was in like waders all the way top to toe to tail. It was uh, he was stomping around like in terms of giving the vibe that there was a game of cricket likely to happen. The fact that this guy was waterproofs from the, his big toe to his ears. <laughs> was not a good sign. Uh-huh. But it was a good read. If you ever wanted to work out how the operation was going, you were drawn in immediately mm-hmm. to this uh, Heisenberg figure who was stomping around the outfield looking like a kid jumping in puddles. Good on him. He was highly visible and everybody else was dressed in dark colours and it was just him in his yellow jumpsuit. And yeah, I couldn't help it as, as soon as you mentioned Walter White during the day, the do first thing that popped in the first lie. thing that popped in my head was I am the one who mops uh, while, while he was out there. But well, they didn't have a super sopper. They didn't have very good covers. They didn't have very big covers. But in the end, they didn't need them because the ground drained England one, which means that depending what happens later on tonight, they may, should be through to the Super A's if the likely result happens. Or if not, it'll be an amazing uh, triumph for Scotland and we will talk about it on the show tomorrow. That's it. That's enough. T20 World Cup Daily uh, for Westfield. You can find us on patreon.com slash the final word. Thanks to Rory Dollard. I'm Jeff Lemon. We'll see you later.